Somewhere in between the radical arguments of today's world topics of sports, faith, politics, and the economy lies evasive conclusions called the truth. Somewhere in between has a mission of getting to the truth, that place where revelation lies and wisdom prevails. Hey everybody, welcome to Somewhere In Between, high atop the Caldwell Banker Office in the Denver Tech Center uh, with your host, Coach Moles and the Coop. And uh, today we got a special guest, uh, a dear friend of mine, and uh, we've known each other since high school, being recruited to the University of Miami, Coach Mark Richt. How are Coach you, buddy? Coach Rick. I feel like I'm at home, man. I grew up in Boca Raton until I was about 13, so it feels pretty cool to be uh, back in Colorado with you guys. You bet, you bet. So, kind of, I'm just, throw, I'm just gonna throw a quick one out there. Uh, our first college game together was in Boulder, Colorado, against CU. Right. And uh, and Mark uh, replaced the quarterback that went down, and then and I replaced the tight end that goes down. And Mark throws me a touchdown pass up at CU, and we thought we were gonna be like the next M M&M, and M, right? <laughs> Mark and Mark, yeah. we were like, I was like, God, that, what, what's so hard about that? We're, this is college. What's so yeah. hard about that, right? <laughs> Until we do you remember, do you remember the pregame speech? Do you, do you remember the pregame speech from Coach Saban? Say Coach it. Saban, here's our pregame. Coach Lou Saban. This, this was Lou Saban, yeah, yeah. Saban. Lou Saban, Lou Saban. right? He, he's our, he's our coach. And we're in the locker room getting ready to go for our first college game. So we're all fired up waiting for the big speech, right? And Coach Saban says, man, I used to coach here with the Denver Broncos. I got a lot of friends in town here. I don't want you all to embarrass me today. <laughs> that, was, that was the pregame speech. Yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, uh, <laughs> you know Mark, uh, my dad and Lou Saban were like best friends when he was coaching the Broncos here. My dad. And- yeah. Yeah, I will tell you there. So that was a short, that was a short friendship because yeah, they didn't yeah. stay very long anywhere. <laughs> no. That's right. That, there was a lot of lore in the local pubs. I can tell you that about those oh, two. Man. But uh, you, well, well, so Mark and I, Mark and I's introduction was being recruited at the same time by Lou Saban right. to the University of Miami. So in, in high school, I was right. a tight end, and obviously Mark was throwing the ball all over the place back in the day, and uh, and I'd run, I'd drive up to Boca Raton and we'd run routes with guys and. You know, do you know, you know, one on one stuff, seven on seven stuff. But Mark, you know, by the way, Mark was a heck of a good basketball player too. He gave me everything I could, I could take going to the hoop. <laughs> Not bad. I could shoot. <laughs> I had to play bully ball on him all the time. Uh, exactly, yeah. and I, you know, when there's no referees, <laughs> I, you know, I could hang on I... your arms and uh, slow <laughs> you down a little bit. Neither of you look like much of basketball players. Oh, hey, we had some, we had some game, right? <laughs> game for sure. <laughs> in southern florida i'm sure you guys fit on that court well oh my goodness so so mark and i so we go to the university of miami and uh and, and can we back up coop just yeah 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 yeah. remember yeah. that all-star game we were in oh yeah yeah so we were roommates we're, at the all we're roommates at the high school all-star game we're, you're we're, right. we're all stars i mean can you can you imagine that but anyway so we we get our you wear your uh college team's helmet for the game. So everybody's right. wearing their college team helmet at this high school all-star game to kind of show off where you're going. Well, we get our helmets and we're like, we just see this U on it, this orange and green U. We're like, that looks kind of stupid. I mean, what, what do you mean the U? I mean, we're from Miami. It doesn't say Miami. It doesn't say nothing. We're the Hurricanes. I guess you can't draw a picture of a hurricane. So we didn't realize how important the U is going to be, baby, yeah. like it you is baby. now. The U. But uh, we, we, uh, I remember, remember we were posing, doing Heisman poses. I think I still got <laughs> pictures. We got no I shirts did. on. We got get our jeans on, no shirts, and yep. we're doing Heisman with our helmets on. Well, you, Heisman you, throw me a, you throw me a touchdown pass in that game, too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, we're uh, lighting it up. Over Rod Reek, right, who was a quarterback at Miami later, and he's like, oh, I hit no, you up after you caught that pass. I was like, yeah, look at the scoreboard. So we were, he lit you up in the end zone. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what what year was this? Like 1978. <laughs> 78, baby. 78. 78. Oh, too much fun. I'll tell you what. That was my last year of college football. Yeah, then the, well, we ended up being we ended up being roommates in college too. 
Yeah. So yeah, a lot that's of, a lot whole of other story. And we had a lot of great roommates too. I mean, we had a, a big Clem. I mean, Clem, do you, yeah. big Clem. I mean, love that guy. To right. Death. And he was a big offensive guard. Clem Barberino. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think I broke the record. I, right? I mean, you guys busted my chops the other day. You said I had the most. This is true. Other, we had four. We had, you know, pods, two, two and twos, right? And I, I think I went through the most roommates in my room. And, and Mark and yeah. Clem were, were the steadies, right? I mean, I must have had six other roommates. Well, <laughs> that <period of> <laughs> said I, I just wrote them off. <laughs> when he said you know, we had Mark. a lot of great roommates, uh, he was he, we, we didn't have a lot of roommates, but they, they lasted one semester with Coop. I could tell you, I was one semester with Coop as well because it was, it was Jim Kelly and Barbarino first. And yeah. me and you were on the other one. That's but the right. thing Coop would do, Coop, before he'd go to bed, he had a we had a, our bunk. We had kind of bunk beds, sort of just kind of sideways bunks. I'm on the bottom. He's on the top. Well, he'd climb up on my bed to get onto his bed, but he'd always wipe his feet on my sheets before he before he'd go to bed at night. <laughs> I mean, he I can't tell you how many wrestling matches we had. He still does that. Oh yeah, we did. <laughs> You know, uh, he says Clem. Uh, he's talking about Clem, and I'm thinking you're talking about Ryan Clement. No, Clem Barbarino, and who yeah. came from Colorado. He was a Mullen Pens- High School in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, you're talking. Yeah, so Clem- did you play with? No, Ryan Clement was like ten years behind. Yeah, Mark that's right. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was at uh, Butch Davis's crowd, and and Mark and I played right. for. Uh, were recruited by Lou Saban, but really played for Howard Schnellenberger. Right. And uh, one yeah, one year we Lou Saban. You don't bring up Lou Saban very often. No. We have Schnellenberger all the time. Lou, yeah. Lou Saban, he, he was a very interesting man. Uh, he, at one time, we played the Gators one game, and he went through like six, literally six quarterbacks in one game. Uh, three of us twice. He, he, he fired every quarterback two times until he got down to no one left. And uh, But he, he would, you know – if you're hanging around him after practice or something, he'd be like your best, your best grandfather. You know, you'd be hanging out with him, and he'd, you'd sure. think you were best friends. And then, in the game, something came over the guy. He just went nuts on you, and uh, he he ruined a lot of psyches. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with throwing uh, chairs. Uh, and uh, we we love we love. You know, How long was he there? Just a couple of years. Yeah, Luke. Two years. Yeah, Luke came from Buffalo, uh, and his wife had actually, uh, I think, had a suicide, if I remember right. Passed away. Yeah, yeah passed away, and then uh, he came to the University of Miami. He was only there for two years, and then Howard came in, and and uh, Howard came over from the Miami Dolphins, being the se- uh, the offensive coordinator from the Miami Dolphins, and they were seventeen and zero. Right. And really exactly. took took over where uh, Howard had taken over, recruiting a lot of us local guys. And really concentrated on he kind of had they called it a demarcation line in Florida where he was going to get everybody on the south end of Florida. Yeah, the state of Miami Florida, called it. Florida State, exactly. Yeah, and that's how uh, he built that program. Um, but well, our uh, class though that that Coach Saban recruited that was back when you could sign thirty kids. Twenty seven out of thirty played some form of pro ball at least one season. Uh, it was yeah. it was a loaded class, and loaded. Uh, that that. Uh, that recruiting trip on that boat out there in the bay with all the uh, girls in bikinis, that worked out pretty good, didn't it? Always. Now I'm starting to figure out how you became a born again Christian. I have to tell all these stories right now. You didn't have a choice. You got it, happened back today, it happened in 86. <laughs> <laughs> you got back into the same corner I got back into. So, well, no, Mark, so Mark on goes on. Mark goes on. To, uh, we actually we come out here to uh, Denver. I get drafted. Mark uh, is a free agent. And, um, right. and, um, he, he, you know, I mean, you got Kubiak and Elway and I forget all the quarterbacks we had out here. Yeah. And then I left the Berg, the Berg. Yeah. 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 I left seven, I left seven days in camp. It was amazing. Martin was gone. Yeah. And then he go. <laughs> then you go to the, you went down to the Dolphins though. Went down to the Dolphins. Yeah. Had a shot there. Right. And then you got yes, right so. into coaching with, at Florida State. Right. right with Bobby. After the two. Yes. Coach Bowden, who, by the so, way, you so, probably know, is uh, going through the uh, I, I did the COVID right now. Uh, so prayers up for Coach Bowden, please. Anybody watching this? You bet. Yeah. So, yeah. so tell us about the Florida State. Um, we lost a little bit of track during that time because when I was playing in the league and you were coaching and and we caught up a few times. Right. Um, but tell us a little bit about the Florida State experience. 
Right. Well, uh, became a graduate assistant coach in 1985 with Coach Bowden. Got to coach the quarterbacks. It was kind of unusual to be a GA and be the quarterbacks coach, but he allowed me to do that, uh, which was great. But the most significant thing by far in my life that's ever happened is uh, the result, unfortunately, of a, a shooting death of one of our players, Pablo Lopez, a big, good-looking offensive tackle from Miami. Uh, got in an argument with a kid on campus at a campus party, and pride got the best of both of them. And the uh, kid got his pride hurt, left, brought back a shotgun to the party, and Pablo uh, – was kind of walking towards him saying, you're not going to shoot me, bro. And uh, the kid shot and uh, killed Pablo that night. And uh, so anyway, just you can imagine what that scene looked like. But then, um, you know, it was an open date. So it was during the season. We probably had a day or two uh, before everybody got back in town. So Sunday night when everybody got back in town, Coach Bowden had a meeting. And he, you could tell he was hurt. Uh, everybody was hurt. And I was, I was a, that young GA in the back of the room, kind of making sure, taking role and making sure the media wasn't hanging around. And uh, Coach Bound basically said something like this. He said, men, you know, I don't know where Pablo is. I don't know where he's going to spend eternity. I don't know where he was with his faith. He goes, but I can tell you there's a, there's a God in heaven who created this world, who created you, who loves you. And wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. But the problem is sin. You know, when Adam sinned, sin entered all men. So everybody's spirit, uh, we were born with that sin nature of Adam. So the most easy thing we do is sin. But, you know, if in order to come to heaven, you got to be perfect. Well, you, you can't be perfect because everybody sins and falls short of the glory of God. But if, But that's why God gave us his son Jesus to to live that perfect life and to, uh, you know, die on the cross and res was resurrected and died for our sins, past, present, and future. And he said, he said, men, you guys are 18 to 22 years old. You think you're going to live forever, just like Pablo. He used to sit in that seat right there. Now he's gone. He said, if that was you last night, instead of Pablo, do you know where you spent eternity? So he's talking to the team. I'm in the back of the wow. room and all the memories of actually John Peasley Coop. Uh, back one summer, I spent some time with him. You know, John was about as wild as all of us were. Yeah. One summer, he comes back and got this piece about him. And I'm like, what, you know, what happened to you, man? And he kind of laid out the gospel to me. And I was thinking maybe that was for me. Even back then, I, I really appreciated. I was attracted to the peace that he had in his life. He went from this angry dude to a guy with, with this piece. And but then I was worried about what, you know, what my roommates would say. I was worried about what my girlfriend would say. I was worried, more worried about what man thought than what God thought and uh, not very smart. And, uh, and then I was also still selfish. I wanted to do what I wanted to do still. You know, I was, I was afraid if I became a Christian, I'd go on a mission trip somewhere to Africa. I didn't want to do that, you know? And then also, I didn't want to be a hypocrite. You know, I thought that if I become a Christian, then I have to stop sinning. I have to be perfect. I didn't understand grace and the forgiveness of all sin. And so, you know, I take an inventory of my sin. I'm like, I think I could stop this and I might could stop this. And I'm like, I know I'm not going to stop this sin right here. So there's no way. So I put that decision for Christ off. And by the grace of God, I lived long enough to be there when Coach Bowden said, man, if that was you last night instead of Pablo, where would you spend eternity? And I and I and and it hit me right in the heart. And I was like, I know where I'd spend eternity, and it's, a, it's not a very good place. So he invited the players to come see him anytime they wanted to talk about him. So that night I was dating my, my now girl, my now wife, Catherine. I said, I'm going to go see Coach Bowden tomorrow and pray to receive Christ is my Lord and Savior. She, she's like, all right. And so the next day I knock on the door, you know, and he's like, come on in, buddy. And he, he calls he calls your buddy when he can't remember your name. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I say, Coach, I know you're talking okay, to those buddy. players. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he said, I, I said, Coach, I know you're talking to those players. But uh, 
would you mind talking to me about this? So I, I did pray to receive Christ that day. And uh, life became very simple, uh, not easy, but simple in that I had a new goal in life. And that was to try to please God with what I do and just kind of turn it over to him and say, I'll do whatever you ask me to do, God. And uh, that's kind of how I've been operating ever since. No, that's a great story, Mark. Hey, was there? Did you ever get to know a fellow named Tom Park? Uh, oh yeah, Tom's a, Tom's a good friend of mine. And, what is Tom? Right. What, Tom who is Tom? Tom is an old. Tom is in Tallahassee, Florida. Okay. He lives in Tallahassee, okay. and he uh, he he was he coached. And he was a military guy. Okay. And uh, so he coached at uh, Citadel, I think. He coached, and then he got into representing people. Uh, yes. Representing coaches and things of that nature. So he's a good man. So, Mark, how many years were you at Florida State? I, I don't remember exactly. I was at I was fifteen at Florida State. So right, and you popped you out know, one year to be coach somewhere else and came back. I think. Yeah, yeah. In eighty nine, I went to East Carolina University. Became the uh, well. I'll back up just a second. I was a graduate assistant two years, volunteer assistant for two years. I still had the coaching responsibility of the quarterbacks, but you're only allowed nine full time guys. Okay. Coach yeah, Bowden right. kind of found a way to get an extra coach, so to speak. Well, then my first real job that actually got a true salary and benefits and all that kind of stuff, I became the offensive coordinator at East Carolina University under Bill Lewis for one season. And uh, we went five and five and five, five and one. And we thought we had won the Super Bowl because East Carolina hadn't won many games back then. Uh, But, uh, you know, my first time coordinator, scared to death, worked with two guys that offensive line coach and running backs coach that knew a lot more ball than I did. And uh, every day I kind of woke up nervous about things. And then when, when I finally uh, prayed my way through it, uh, my, my faith got a little stronger than my fear and, and that went away. But that was another, that was another journey or another spiritual milestone to kind of, I remember praying to God while I was at Florida state, God, grow my faith, grow my faith. Well, he did. He sent me off to East Carolina <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and I and I really, uh, you know, the thing about that that stint is I learned how to be a coordinator, and uh, I learned how to do it when not many people were watching. Uh, but I also it also did grow me in my faith. And then when I went, you know, back the very next year to Florida State, a couple of years down the road after that, I was more prepared to be the offensive coordinator and play caller. Nice. How long were you the OC at uh, Florida State? Um, about seven years, my yeah. last seven years. And we, you know, we, you know, I was there during the stint where they went 14 years in the top five. Florida right. State did. Yeah. And one, you know, played and played five national championship games. We won two of them. I coached a couple of Heisman Trophy winners, you know, Chris Winkie and Charlie Ward. And even Casey Weldon was a runner up to the Heisman. So I got a chance to do a lot of things that coaches would dream to do. And, Thankfully, I was I was um, balanced in my approach to life because of my faith, and didn't get too carried away with all that stuff. We're taking a little break from our podcast, and I this is uh, Coach Moles. You've been seeing uh, some of the podcasts. I'm here on behalf of Florian McCann and Mile High Aeration. Uh, in just a, just a couple seconds here, in this uh, in this promo for Mile High Aeration, you'll be able to take down the uh, the phone number and the website where you can go uh, set up your your next appointment with uh, Florian and his uh, fine group over at Mile High Aeration. Uh, listen, we're Colorado. Not aerating your grass is like mistreating your children. <laughs> Thank God I'm not running for president, but it happens to be true. There comes a time when you have to aerate your lawn, uh, particularly in the spring and the fall. And we're in the fall right now, uh, and uh, we're heading into winter. And we will be soon heading into spring before you know it. And we are a clay-based geographical location here in Colorado. That clay gets wet, it gets dry, it hardens. And it starts to choke out the, the, the roots of your grass. Hey, treat them nice. Uh, get it aerated. It'll hold hold the water and save the roots, and keep your lawn healthy all year long. So, hey, take a look at this. This is a uh, a photo of 
milehighservices.com, uh, which is Mile High Aeration's website. You see the website at the top, uh, www.milehighservices.com, and you have the phone number 303-778-1000. Hey, pause the video for a second, write it down, and give Florian and his crew a call. This is Coach Malls from my good friend Florian McCann and the kind people at Mile High Aeration. So uh, you left uh, Florida. You left Florida State. Is was that when you went to Georgia, or did you go somewhere else? Yes, that's when you went to Georgia. So, um, after the nineteen ninety nine, ninety nine, we went undefeated. Two thousand season. After the two thousand season, uh, we lost. Actually, lost to Oklahoma, like ten to two in that game. It was a horrible embarrassment. I'm talking about for the national championship while at Florida State. But I'd already accepted a job uh, at Georgia. And uh, I was trying to do both jobs at the same time, which was tough. Wow. Uh, I, I really, uh, you know, to do it again, well, I, would, I would say I would just take the job and move on. Not that I, But Coach Bowden asked me if I would stay and call the plays. You know, so what are you going to do? But as much as you're, I was trying while to you're recruiting, the morning, while you're While you're recruiting against yeah. him on the other side? Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it was crazy. And we even made a, <laughs> we made a little tough. pack that, yeah, we made a pack that, <laughs> I wasn't going to recruit any kids unless they were already on Georgia's board. I wasn't going to rob the Florida State board, you know, unless oh, uh, they were already that's on awesome. Georgia's board. So we we tried to try. I mean, I wanted to leave in an honorable way. I mean, Coach Bowden meant everything to me, and you know, I love the guys. And then you looked at Georgia's board, and there had to be some Florida <laughs> State guys on that board. I well, think, you know? I'll tell you, it was a funny story about that too. I go to Georgia, and first year you're trying to recruit and just kind of collect. Not the scraps, but, you know, once a coach gets fired and all these kids take off in all directions and some are staying true to the Georgia or some are waiting to see who the next coach is and all that, well, things weren't going very well, that recruiting cycle. And I remember being at a basketball game with some recruits and some one of the boosters called me uh, on the floor there and said, hey, coach, if you guys don't start doing a little better job of recruiting, my buddy told me to tell you we're going to start buying these kids. And I said, let me tell you. I said, let me tell you something. I said, you tell your friend if he does that crap, he's going to be, uh, you know, just killing the thing that he thinks he loves, you know. And so anyway, I'm like, I go back to the hotel room because my family hadn't caught up with me yet. We're still just moving in the hotel with all the coaches just recruiting away and all that. And so I'm I'm in the hotel room, and I'm talking to God, saying, God, what in the world have you got me into? And I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And in my spirit, God said, you're right. You can't do this by yourself. He goes, but I will certainly be with you. Just like he told Moses when he told Moses to take my people out of Israel. Moses is like, who am I, Lord, to do that? I don't already, I've already blown it. But God said, I will certainly be with you. And he said that to my spirit that night and, you know, helped me kind of just kind of keep rolling. And, you know, in that class, we had David Pollock, who uh, was a first-round draft pick. Uh, was the winner of every award you could get, three-time uh, All-American on defense, defensive end, uh, Thomas Davis, first-round draft pick. Guys that people maybe – they weren't that highly rated, but by the time they left our program, they were really great players. And uh, so we were – God, you know – But you had, a lot of, for sure. you had a lot of NFL guys play Have you ever counted? in Georgia. Have you ever counted how many guys left your program? Uh, it's got to be hundreds. It's or thousands. Many. It was, it was, thousands. It's not thousands, but like even uh, draft picks. If you if you go fifteen years and average five, yeah, what's that? There you go. Yeah, good point. Good point. So it, we were we were in the I think it was eighty nine players were drafted during the time I was there, and uh, you know a bunch of them first round draft picks. And I'd say a lot of our free agents made it. Uh, the kids were uh, like even a guy most recently, uh, David. Uh, Oh, goodness. The center for the New England Patriots. Um, now I can't think of his name, but he hurt his – he had a finger or a thumb surgery this year. But, um, you know, he's a guy that the Patriots took and he became the starting center in his second year. Uh, well, I mean, coming uh, out of so, the SEC uh, alone, I mean, ACC is is pretty good football, but the SEC, you know, both divisions of yeah, that is almost like minor league football. I mean, NFL football. I mean, you guys just – 
I right. mean, it's hard to come out of there even clean with all the uh, injuries right. you guys get. I mean, I remember, you know, following you in Georgia and, uh, you know, I'd watch Miami games, I'd watch Georgia games, and, and the amount of injuries you had to you know, keep players over the years was kind of interesting to, to uh, right. well, like you had Hurley one year, and I think he was out half the year, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, it's it. There's going to be attrition, as we all know, and and it's it's a you know it's it is a brutal brutal physical schedule. Uh, you know, people want to say this and that and the other, but the bottom line is, uh, you hook up against. I mean, you come off the bus and you're in pregame warmups, and you see how their dudes look. They look just like your dudes. You know, they, everybody looks like Alabama. Everybody looks like LSU. Everybody looks like Georgia. Everybody looks like Tennessee. Uh, Mississippi State looks like them. You know, Ole Miss looks like them. I mean, it's just you're playing against full-grown men, and it's we know it's a violent collision sport. So you definitely have to deal with that and, uh, you know, figure out who's going to play next, you know. Are you watching college football? I know you're, 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 you're a, a play-by-player right. uh, broadcaster. Right now, in the right. SEC or is ACC. it the ACC? Yeah. Well, I'm, in the, ACC I'm with network. the ACC network. And, uh, you know, so Saturday for me, our pregame show before the first kick at noon, then there's a noon game, there's a 4 o'clock game and an 8 o'clock game on the network, plus ABC picks up a bunch of other games. So there are times during the day I'm trying to watch three ACC games at the same time. And then at every halftime and in between every, every game, I'm on the air again. So I really only watch – ACC football every once in a while there's only one ACC game on and I might could flip back and forth a little bit he got a nephew uh what's that no go ahead finish about your nephew well I was gonna say I got a nephew uh Brad Johnson if you know who Brad is yeah played quarterback you know 18 years in the NFL and won a Super Bowl Gruden with Tampa Bay he married my sister I coached him at Florida State but his he got two boys that are studs the oldest is already a quarterback, a backup quarterback at LSU. And uh, and then his other son is a sophomore tight end who's been offered by everybody in America. Um, but, you know, that LSU-Mississippi uh, State game, I watched a good bit of it because we were wondering if Max might get in the game uh, when the first, first team guy was struggling a little bit. I mean, how wild – I don't know if you guys saw any of that game, but it was wild. 620 yeah, was- yards passing – I mean, wow. it's crazy. Mississippi State took them to school. Yeah, and then then they get seven points the next week. Mississippi State. Yes, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Mississippi I State to... looked. I mean, Mississippi State. I mean, I mean, Mississippi State looked like a juggernaut and made LSU look like just pedestrian after being the greatest team in college football ever. But that's what happens when you lose. You know, nineteen starters or whatever it is. It is, Coach. If I just well, follow, in there. if I just followed one Twitter account every day, it would be Mike Le- Mike Leach's Twitter account. He, he's he's the funniest <laughs> he's man. A that is, have to check him out. Ever born. He's a he's a brilliant coach. Right. I've met him a few times at like the FCA and stuff like that. He wouldn't remember who I am, but I'm very. Then you got Lane Kiffin over there at Ole Miss. So you got Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss, and you got. You got a coach at uh, Mississippi State, Mike Leach. I mean, it, it's a comedy show, for sure. It's it's pretty interesting. So one of the good ball coaches. Gonna ask you, do you watch the yeah. NFL? Um, yeah, I get now. I do get a chance to see some NFL ball, and you know, people ask me who my team is, but you know, you cheer for people. It's a lot of guys I've coached yeah, that we just mentioned. Yeah. So right, all the yeah. kids that are at all these teams. I could be cheering for both teams teams at the same time because I got you know one or two guys on each team. So, and then you have coaches that you know and love that maybe moved from college to pro, and you see so you're cheering for them. And you know, like we got a real close friend who coaches with the Falcons, and they got snake bit. You know, two out of three games they had a beat, and then they lose. Boy, and they, they did, lost yeah. Another one. It's zero yeah, and four now. Is struggling. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, you, know, know you, you feel for those guys. I know you might not be able to even say say something something like this but uh uh as i never had good filters you know at any age and i certainly <laughs> don't have any now uh but coach i watch the nfl right now and i'm watching tackling that sophomores in high school know how to tackle better than these guys do they are missed yeah. you know it it is a, a bad brand of football in my opinion uh watching the saturday games they're still out there 
getting after it. Um, and yeah. it's it's a much it's a much more traditional game to watch college football now than watch. I mean, I, what was the game on uh, Monday night? Kansas City. Yeah, the Kansas City, Kansas City played the Patriots. Right? Was it the Patriots they played? God, why am I dry? I'm never really. The tackling in that game was yeah, it was Patriots. Horrendous. Yeah, yeah, it was the Patriots and. You know, I just look at it and I say, how do you coach? You get 13 days, as you said, Mark, 13 days in pads, right. in, pads in an entire season. And I think the brand of football's dropped. Uh, coach, I don't know if you can comment on that. but Well, I think kind of part of it, you got to have some kind of grace for the COVID virus. I mean, it did change everybody's prep, high school, college, pro. Uh, so – but the NFL, you know, they get the collective bargaining agreement and they start saying, you know, for player safety, we're only going to be in pads so many times in practice and all that type of thing. Really more closer to a college model because colleges do say, hey, one day a week you could be in full pads. You know, the other day you could be in shells. The other days you got to be in shorts. So there's a little bit of – it makes a little bit of sense. But the bottom line is if you don't practice tackling, it's hard to be good at tackling. You can roll That's as many right. donuts out there as you want and – do all the form tackles, but there's human beings with that that are agile and strong as heck, and they got they got you know bad intentions too. So it's hard and to be good these, tackling in seasons like this when you have an off season of just not yeah, enough really, work. I mean, the, the Broncos uh, going into their first game had not put anybody on the ground. No cutting, no chop right. blocks. You know, no no cutting at the line of scrimmage. No, you know, none of that. I mean, you see that, but you see that. Right. You see that during the game. I mean, you see some blitz packages coming through where where we'd have lit guys up and and cut them. You know what I mean? And they're not and they're just not prepared right. to cut them. And uh, you're seeing a lot right. of DBs right now picking offensive linemen off for the D, for the D linemen to run around. And that's kind of like the new right. the new pick scheme, right? And um, yep. which has kind of been interesting to watch for me because you know all I watch is linemen play and um, feet and hands and hat placement and et cetera. So. For me, watching the uh, kind of a new scheme on defense coming at the offensive line has kind of been interesting to me. But, um, I mean, uh, you know, you, you always want to stay up so you don't get somebody thrown into the quarterback's legs, right? But every once in a while, right. you got to chop a dude coming coming around the corner fast uh, just to just to slow him down the next time, you right. know? And I don't see any of that. So There's it's kind of no it's kind of it's, it's kind of it's kind of like yeah. losing losing arrows in your quiver. You know, you don't have as many to use. Yeah, so. There's no doubt. Yeah, you mentioned the. Uh, not taking anybody to the ground before the season started. Uh, and everybody has a different coaching philosophy, but Coach Donnan, who was before me at Georgia, he had more of that NFL mentality, and he he would not go live uh, in his in his practices or scrimmages. What well, Florida State with Coach Bowden, we went live every day on Tuesday on the goal line. We went live yeah. every day in inside drill. Yeah. We went live uh, first and ten situations, good on good. Good yeah. on good. So I go to Georgia, and they, they had – the first time we went 11-on-11 11 11, good on good, it was like I had a, a defensive end who pretended like he was rushing the passer and then pretended like he was defending a cut. And I had a running back who was pretending like he was cutting the guy. And I said – I blew the whistle. I, I, I've never blown the whistle in my whole life. I, I call everybody up, so I'm like, bro. This ain't the way we do it. We don't get after each other here. The first time we went live goal line, our offense scored eight plays in a row. Ones versus twos and twos versus one defense. At Georgia, we scored eight in a row. That would never happen at Florida State. We might score one out of eight because that defense was breathing fire. And so that was a whole – it's a mentality, too, as much as a, sure the physical act is doing it. By, by the way, Coach, absolutely. You know, we, we, we get some toughness. We second and third stringers don't like it referred to as good on good. <laughs> <laughs> Your second team is still well, part of the good, baby. Well, you, know, yeah. good. you know the uh, that's that's an interesting interesting you say that too because like on think about all the amount of the third and one fourth and one you know all the short yardage stuff. You know, if you don't know, if you haven't been putting your hat under a guy's hat and you haven't been trying to drive him out right. of there and grunt him out of there, and the defensive guys haven't been trying to bust, you know, go through the legs and get into the backfield and all that stuff. I mean, you when you don't have right. reps at that, it's hard to rep them in the season when you're only getting one, one or two a game that's right. or three a that's game, right. right? So all of a sudden, that's what turns football into sloppy football, right? And guys playing high, and it right. just it, that's I, I agree with all of that. It's but but 
you know, player safety, player uh, CBA, um, guys getting so much money now. I mean, so many things right. have changed. I mean, what, what have you seen, Mark, mostly? You talking about NFL or? Yeah, I mean, well, even either one, you know, both. both. Both, you know, college, how college changed while you were in it. I mean, you were in there for how many, 14, yeah. 15, 18, well, how many years? 35 oh, years. 35, 35, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking <laughs> Right. Yeah. Eighteen. Uh, yeah. Eighteen. Yeah. Head coach. But but sure. yeah, in the game since since we left college, and right. uh, and so it, it, over it time, sucks. just to answer yeah. your question. Over time, we did scrimmage less. We did go live less. We still did it. I still believed in it. And uh, but when you get a guy, or even like having having your back in the day, quarterbacks were live in scrimmages, in your in your spring scrimmages and in your three scrimmages before the season start, quarterbacks were live. And then it came to where, you know, you put those guys in the green jersey or whatever jersey you put them in, don't touch pink, them. Dude. Pink, yeah. And it, pink, yeah, pink. And so, anyway, you know what? I did notice one thing. Teams with sorry quarterback play ain't worth a crap. The teams with <laughs> the good quarterbacks are pretty good. But anyway, you got to have protection, right, Coop? You bet. Anyway, it starts right uh, there, baby. I mean, we we used so, to so let you wear one of those. Did you go wear? Live. Go ahead. What's that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I no, we were live ahead. back when I back when I was in college. Yeah. Quarterbacks were live. You know, that's a whole other story. I mean, remember Smith? What was Smith at defensive end? The big oh, Don Smith. Oh, Don, Don Smith. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he, he this guy he looked had like a Don. He was a senior. He was a. I, well, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Him and Larry the mean, Yeah, they were mean as hell, right? So oh my we're God. riding on the bus to go to the Orange Bowl to scrimmage. Our first scrimmage is, is rookies. And he's looking at me just seething, just like – and he looks at me. He goes, hey, pretty boy. He goes, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get your ass today. You better be ready for me because I'm coming to knock you out, you know. And I'm like, oh, no. Uh, I was like, do we actually have to have the scrimmage? But uh, anyway, getting back to quarterbacks and, and scrimmages, when once you get a guy hurt in a scrimmage, I don't care if it's whether you're quarterback, receiver, DB, and you're like, I can't, you know, why did we scrimmage today? You know, could we have gotten better without it? So it was, it was a tough balance as a coach to decide how much you go live and how much you don't. Well, it's like everything in life, you know, you got to balance. You got to balance it. Uh, you know, I, I know that every single season that I uh, played football and, you know, I was fortunate and unfortunate enough to play for four NFL teams and get cut by all of them. Um, but I remember going against guys like Ron Yeri in, 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 for the Vikings every single day. And the right. first two days I'd be just sore as heck, you know, and then it would go away. I mean, literally go yeah. away for the rest Amazing, of the season. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just go away. It's yeah. building your shell. So Amazing. I think it's a little bit like when you when yeah. I go down to Florida. My, you know, my my dad was one of the original developers of Marco Island uh, back in the day, and my mom was down in Naples, so I go down to Florida all the time. But I go down there for eight days or ten days or twelve days or whatever. Yeah, you know, it takes me a couple of days, and then the next thing I know, the humidity's not so not so bad anymore. And and then I, you know I come back right. to Colorado, and if it's cold, I get used to. It. I think the body oh, yeah. adjusts, and I don't think we're. I think part of the injury problem yeah. is that we don't allow these players' bodies to adjust. They're going from being yeah. soft all week and not getting enough. So there, there's there's got to be a balance there, Mark, where you got to yeah. have con contact with these guys. Well, it's like developing some callus. Right and in yeah, the beginning, exactly. when you, you yeah. get that hammer. You hammer enough early on, you will get a blister, and then after a while, that thing toughens up and becomes a callus. Becomes a callus. I, I got to add to your story though with with uh, you, Don, you can Don, teach Mark. You didn't Don, touch him. Don Smith and, and Foles. I forget Foles. He was end up being Lex Luger in the WWF. I remember walking into the weight room as as freshman, and those two guys were in the weight room, and it was a tiny little weight room, and they both had their shirts off, and they're in just you know <clears> uh, gym shorts, and they're screaming. You know, as they're lifting, right, and the bars yeah. are bent, uh, the bars are bending, and they're screaming and they're sweating, and and and, and I remember walking in there thinking it looked just like a WWF wrestling yeah, match. I mean, as big these guys were monstrous, right? As, and they're both seniors yeah. going to go into the NFL, uh, as and we're just <laughs> punk punk freshmen coming right out of high school. So they, that, they that's look, they look a certain way. 
they looked a certain way for a certain reason, and they acted a certain way for a certain reason. That's about as far as I'm going to go with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, they might listen to this and come after us, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What they, those guys yeah. were church bo- church choir boys. They they were awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm certain. So, Coach, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make an L7 turn uh, back to college. Uh, right. Some stuff about college, real quick, about recruiting. Um, I'm just going to bring up some concepts of my experiences being on the player side of trying to help guys get recruited. And you know, I, you know, some people say, you know, he's one of those recruiting services. He's one of those guys that does. That's not what we did. Uh, I right. most of my the people that I worked with, I got them, some of them in the eighth grade, ninth grade, and trained them outside their schools. Um, not every school, you know, has great training for high school kids. Right. You know, you probably oh, yeah. can guess that. So kids that wanted to develop, they would come out and we would train them all the way through. Uh, Cam was one of the guys that, were, that that we trained. And I would tell them, listen, you're going to, you know, where am I? They'd say, where, where, do you think you can give me a Division One?" Uh, scholarship, but say so you're going to get what you earn. Uh, I've never right. had a kid not get what he earns. And if you earn that level, you just need to understand what that level is. And you need to have a guy who's working with you that understands what level you need to get to. And I went out and right. visited all the colleges, you know, over 200 college campuses. I went and visited and looked at, looked at uh, what they were recruiting. Particularly, I spent a lot of time with uh, Urban Meyer's staff at Utah, Florida, and Ohio State. Even though Urban right. still sees me and goes, uh, "What's your name?" You know. You call uh, you buddy. <laughs> yes, exactly. He called me. He did. <laughs> but anyway, he. Uh, anyway, I got a, I got a good uh, understanding of it. But you know, there were a lot of things that parents would come to me and say, "Man, I, I didn't really know how bad this is." You know, like guys would go to camps. They'd always be encouraged to go to camps for one for one thing. And uh, right. I'm going to have you comment on this first. I'll bring up some other stuff. Mark, sure. you can as well. But I used to tell kids, don't go to their camp. Well, they say I won't get recruited if I go to their camp. I said, you ain't going to get recruited if you go either. Uh, because, you know, if they're looking for bananas, right now you're looking pretty much like an apple. And they ain't buying apples right now. So until you're a banana, don't go. I said, you'll have your time. I think I told Mark this. Um, you'll have your now moment. That's when you can walk on a Division One campus or a college campus, and they'll look at you and say, "We we need that guy." But if you're not there yet, don't go. I'll let you comment on that, Coach. Well, I think you know. With the thing that I would tell parents is that you know, depending on where a kid was in his recruitment, I think it's okay to go to camps when you're a, when you're a younger kid yep. and just get get used to seeing. All the competition around you. I think that in itself is totally agree with that. Yeah, you Absolutely. go to that camp and there's 350 kids there, and you're looking around going, "Oh my goodness, maybe I got a little work to do." So I think, I think it helps them sometimes to say what's reality because, you know, a, a lot of parents are going to say sweet things to you, and a lot of coaches are going to say sweet things to you, and you're going to be in your little league. You may be a big dog in your league, and then you go to one of these camps, and you're like, and it doesn't have to be a college campus. It uh, could be something that Nike does or whoever does. Um, but you get to some of those camps with all those kids and you look around, you're like, okay, I got some work to do. So I think that helps in that regard. But then as you get close to that, you know, you know, summer, of that junior, senior year, uh, I think it's important if you have certain schools that you like and you think that they have interest in me, um, I, I do say go to camp because that you're going to not, you know, what happens is the campers a lot of times think uh, the coaches are evaluating them and making decisions on them, which we are. But on the other hand, you get a chance to get coached by your position coach, possible position right. coach. You get the chance to be uh, under just the organization of the, the, the school it, itself and how they go about their business. You learn a lot about those coaches and those teams uh when you go to those camps as well but i, I agree well, with so, you to say well if you go so if you go to a camp talking, you're not really right. physically ready for them to say you're what i'm looking for you you know you'll get your heart broke but once you're in that position i think it's, I think it's healthy to go to the ones that you have the most interest in in my world coach 95 percent of them are not ready 
you know, and I agree right. with you. And they send them as eighth graders and ninth graders to the youth camp that the that they have on the campus. Totally agree that they go in and they take a look. You know, they there's guys with beards that are in the ninth grade. And you yeah, know, I, exactly. you know, his son was a perfect example. Uh, Mark's son uh, Cam was. Of, yeah, of, you can of tell. Of being underdeveloped. Way underdeveloped. Yeah. yeah, I think Mark, you saw him uh, during the recruiting. Oh period, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a late bloomer. I've seen him lately too. He looks pretty good. Yeah, he's he's getting there. We'll be he'll be fine. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, he's and, just like his old man though. He's gigantic, <laughs> pain in the ass. <laughs> hey, Coop. Yeah, you're a t- you're a tackle. You're not a tight end, bro. You're a tackle. <laughs> I know that's what Howard told me. Luckily. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. If he was if it was up to Coop. I don't know what he'd be doing. He sure wouldn't have been a Denver Bronco, that's for sure. He he was a pretty boy tight end, man. That's his mindset. He had to – what do we have? Just about every other team got hurt, and you finally said, I'll I'll play. I'll play. Well, yeah, well, yeah, no, play that was a, no, see, that's a funny story. So, Howard – Howard calls me in and he says, uh, you know, we're, he says, you're, you know, you you got some good feet and you're strong and you do a decent job of blocking and, and I've, I'm running short on tackles. And I said, no, I said, coach, I appreciate that. But, you know, I think I can do a better job on the other side of the line. I said, you know, Isaiah, I, I, don't, I, I think I'm stronger and, and faster than him. And I forget who was on the other side of Flanagan or I forget whoever. And I said, you know, I think I can, I think I can learn that spot. And I think that's where I can help us best. And he goes, you know, and you know, Howard, more. Well, I, think, yeah. I think you need to help me at the tackle spot. And I'm like, well, but coach, you know, I really, he goes, Mark, do you want to play on this football team? You know, I'm like, uh, yes, sir. He said, well, then I'll see you tackle. You know, and I was like, oh, okay. Thank goodness. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I fell in love with it. I mean, immediately fell in love with that spot. Yeah. But, uh, but, and, and that's, you know, and that changed, you know, changes your life. I mean, some, some, yeah. uh, you know, I, you know, and it's. I talked to my son about this. I talked to a lot of kids about this. I, you know, I tell them to play every spot they can play. You know, like when I got in the NFL, I had a tough career. I got hurt all the time. I had to get a spot, get hurt, get a spot, get hurt. I finally said, you know, if I'm gonna last in this league, I'm gonna learn every spot on this offensive line. And if I'm not the one of the five starters, I'm gonna be the sixth guy because you need eight to get through the season. So right. I'll, I'll create some value. Mm-hmm. And uh, one game, I played every spot on the line except for center. And uh, against Houston. And so I tell these kids all the time, hey, learn to play right. Learn to play left. Practice all these spots. You never know where you're going to be. You never know where you're going to grow into. Um, you know, we've had kids on our teams that have played all – I mean, Cameron played every spot for me over the years, all over the place, wherever I needed them. And then, and then uh, right. you know, a lot of these high school <clears throat> kids, you know, they, they stop growing. I mean, they literally stop growing. You know, they're, they're man dogs That's in right. eighth grade and get in the ninth and they start right. to stop growing. and. They go from a, a offensive lineman or fullback to a to a D, a D lineman, you know, or to a, a linebacker. Right. I mean, and so mm-hmm. so we we've always we always try to drill fundamentals, you know, learn the fundamentals of the game first, and then you know you'll be able to transition right. a lot easier over your career, depending on where a coach puts you or a coach decides to right. put you, right, where you can help that football team. And I, how how many guys did well, you move? Did you move many guys over the years? Uh, we did. You know, even Thomas Davis had first round draft pick. I was talking about. He was a safety um, in college, and we, we recruited him, and he ended up playing, you know, outside linebacker, um, you know, in the NFL for years with with the, uh, with the Panthers. But uh, you know, uh, you know, get back to, uh, you know, the parents trying to figure out how to negotiate or navigate this recruiting process. Right. Uh, I think I think what you guys do is is wonderful. They they need help. I mean, I, I still have coaches who have sons or uh, just people that will call me and say, here, this is my son. What do you think? What should I do? Uh, they do need guidance to help navigate that thing. Absolutely. And the, the service that you provide, you know, mean, means a lot to people. I can promise you. Well, the thing is, is that they were, I kept telling them, you're not paying me to get your son recruited. You're paying me to get your son physically ready to be recruited, and right. I'm not going to I'm not going to ha- just help every kid that wants to be recruited. To go through what I did, I coached them. You know, I mean, I I studied every single position on so many campuses. I can't even tell you, Coach. I, every single position. What do you, What do they have to do? Saw the way the position changed right. over all the years <clears throat> that I did it, and uh, had you know, two years ago I had 450 kids that were in this program around the country. And, you know, parents would 
would always say, or well, can you get him recruited now? Should I, should I be sending out his film? I mean, I literally have parents say, should, I, 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 I'm being told I should send his JV film out. I go, you know, the, yeah, some graduate assistant's really going to be happy to get that JV yeah, film. Don't send the tape. Don't let, don't send the tape unless it's something that they're going to like. I mean, right. obviously, I think I think the tapes are important. I think to be able to show the skill set uh, to these guys, because you know what happens, it goes to the campus. There'll be some graduate assistant coach or somebody who works in the recruiting department that takes the first look, and he'll have a little bit of an eye for it, and he'll he'll send it on to the up the food chain a little bit and we'll finally get to a position coach and maybe a coordinator. Uh, and th those tapes do help a lot. And especially in this COVID era, they're invaluable. Sure. But like you say, don't go to camp unless you're ready and don't send a tape unless you know, you're you. sending it to the right college. You right. Know, eventually you, you want to send tape. You got to put it on tape because Sometimes they don't, the they gear. do care if you're a nice kid. They do care if you're a good student. They do care about all those things. But they want to see, can you play? And the best way to do it is to put it on tape. Coach, I had one coach uh, tell me uh, uh, it was, uh, gosh, it was, an, it was Denver Johnson. Denver Johnson told me, uh, he'd say, hey, coach, uh, you know, we don't want to see if he can play. We want to see if he can win because we're here to win games. Okay, and there ain't right. a guy in this office that's going to have his job if we don't win. And we want to look at guys that will win games for us. Well, I could care less if right. you can play. Because there's a lot of guys who play who can't win. So we're looking for winners, you know. And he, he didn't like guys that gave up during games, you know, that were great players. But he could see on film. Sometimes he'd say, I want to see the whole. And other coaches would say, I want to see the whole game. I want to see him play a whole game because right. I want to see if he quits. I want to see if he does all these different things. So right. the, the next piece that – I always got was from parents was, um, hey, we were up at uh, Georgia, and uh, Coach Finkelstein, uh, the assistant coach, uh, told us that he really likes my kid, you know, really likes him a lot. And then I'd say, did he offer him? And he'd say, well, no, but he really likes him. I said, well, I think, right. I think really likes. <laughs> means that you get offered. But there's a lot of people that in that in my life were always looking at me like, boy, you're you're just a negative person. And these coaches <laughs> would make they'd make it so hard on me to say that <laughs> don't listen to that, man. It's part of their contract. What are they gonna say to you? Hey, listen, your kid's a, you know, he's small, he's he's, you know, fat and he's stupid. Sure. You know, they're not gonna do, they're not gonna do that. But it's amazing to me um, how – is it part of being a college coach and that you have to always have kids leave with a, with a positive impression of what's going on? Uh, can you get in trouble as a college coach if you, if somebody – if you give you just tell them the truth? Hey, listen, you're never going to play here, you know. So, you know, start looking at right. – uh, Let's say the camp right? setting and there's a, there's a bunch of kids uh, at the camp and, you know, that assistant coach is going to – purposely find that kid and his parents on the way out the door to say something to them, they're, they are interested in them. They're not going to yeah. do that. Now, if you go chase down the coach and say, what do you think about my kid? That's a whole different deal. But if that coach at the end of camp grabs you or grabs your son and wants to talk to him, and even if he says we have a high level of interest, I mean, you might have a position coach. He, he can't make an offer until that coordinator says yes. Or he may, can't make an offer until that head coach says yes. So, you know, there is a time where that assistant coach says, look, we like you a lot. I'm going to make sure we get, you know, we watch you the rest of the season. Or I'm going to make sure our offensive coordinator sees you or make sure our head coach sees you and see where it, it can go. So, you know, there there's some of that going on without offering a guy right off the get-go. Hey, do uh, are, are coaches graded <clears throat> on how much time they spend with a kid and whether they get them or not? All right, so, some schools may do that. I never did that. Um, I never would uh, make a big publicity stunt around who signed who, uh, because in in reality, we're all we're we're all signing this kid. The recruiting coach, 
the the uh, the position coach, the coordinator, the head coach, you know, even your strength coach. I mean, everybody's involved in the recruitment of these guys. And I would never like to say, oh, uh, or give bonuses based on how many guys you sign because once that became a big deal or you add value to that, then all of a sudden this coach is like, man, if I sign one more kid, you know, I might get this bonus. Well, you don't want him to bring a kid in because you're going to get a bonus. You want to bring him in because he's going to help you win. So I did not try to make a big stink about it. Now recruiting services do. You know, you can't hardly help that. Uh, you know, this guy's a great recruiter. That guy's a great recruiter. And there are some guys that are much better than others. But the reality is everybody recruits these guys. They're our players. They're not my players. And uh, that's how I try to treat it. Treat it. So would you have a – let's say you have a um, – and I'm just as hypothetical. Let's say you have a coach that uh, is a poor recruiter but a great coach. I mean, you're going to – obviously right. you're keeping that coach around because he's a great coach, right? But if you – if but if he can't recruit – any anyone in essence does he stay out of the recruiting picture other than maybe you know seeing the kids that, that, yeah. that get run through his run by him uh, or in, in college if he can't recruit he's not a great coach period okay now you might be able to recruit around this guy and get get really good players at his position now yeah. he, he may not be a great recruiter as far as beating the bushes and doing all the fancy talks and all that kind of stuff but but when you when you get him when you get a kid on official visit, and he sits down with that old line coach, and he talks ball with that kid, if he could if he could just do that, right. that's a huge part of the recruitment of that kid. You know, maybe not all the bells and whistles that some of these other guys that are flashier. Now, if he gets that kid in the room and that kid walks out of there going, I don't want to play for this guy, then he he just can't be your coach very long. You know, you you have right. to have. The ability kind to of, connect with these kids. These kids kind of comes down to uh, leaving a kid inspired on a recruiting trip, right? You know, having yeah. inspired to play for you and inspired to come and to I'm the this too, A lot of times, when you're telling a kid you like him a lot, you may also be preparing him to to try to become a uh, preferred walk on for your program, which are are like gold. To be honest with you, those kids oh, that yeah. are almost the guy. Talk about that. And then yeah. Say, yeah. I mean, you know, if if you're going to come in, and usually what preferred walk-on means is there's an academic standard that everybody gets in on. And if you're a preferred walk-on, the standard may not have to be quite as high. So you can get a kid in, you know, you may, it may a normal student might be a 1,400 SAT, but you might get in with a, with a 1,200 or 1,000 SAT if you're a, if you're a recruited walk-on. So Thousand? those kids are guys that you know – are going to help you win either on special teams or even on a scout team, given a good look. And you think over time they may develop into a guy that could play ball and, and earn a scholarship for you. And so it used to be you'd save a few spots for walk-ons that deserve scholarships in your recruiting number. Now you're, you're holding not only uh, spots for uh, walk-ons to become scholarship kids, but this transfer portal has changed everything where you better, you better say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. For yeah. three, four, five, maybe more, either graduate transfers or one-time transfers uh, in your in your program, or you're go- or you're going to be making a mistake. That's why I was talking about your son, Coop. Yeah. You know, that's why I was talking about Cam. What happens is some of these kids go to mid-major schools and they start kicking butt, and then Alabama says, "This guy." Don't think Alabama doesn't have a bunch of coaches looking at college players all over the country, just like they do in the NFL looking at free agency. It's the same thing now. That's why these recruiting uh, uh, programs are getting so big out of these campuses across America. They're not only looking at high school kids, junior college kids. They're looking at college kids all across America who may blossom and develop late bloomer. And they're like, I want that guy now. And so they, they, they try to hijack him from the team that they're on. It's getting a little bit scurvy too. Uh, you know, I got a, a kid who was an All American uh, his freshman year at the FCS level, and there you go. He's uh, he's a, he's a six two, two hundred and thirty pound kid who runs, has timed in the four fives, and um, right. I think he's even broken a four five. And uh, he had eighteen solo tackles in one game against North right. Dakota State. You know, and. Right. Uh, he calls me and says, "Hey, co- hey, coach. Uh, 
a friend of mine called me from such and such state. You know, I'm not going to get into sure. the particulars because then I'm going to really, right. really Don't get in trouble. It. But he says, uh, and he says, uh, hey, I, I got, I talked to the coaches at, at this school, and they want you to enter the transfer portal. And this is a major Power Five school. They want, oh, you, yeah. they want you to enter the transfer portal, and they said in five seconds they're going to pick you up. <laughs> He's at an FCS school right now. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, yeah. And, uh, that's there's, exactly what happened. And, and I, I, I've got five athletes that that's happened to their train. It's happened to that too in the last uh, 18 months. They're transferred from. Uh, Get used to it. To, yeah. Get used to it's, it. Uh, there's a, kind of a little bit of a backdoor process going on in this thing. I don't know if it's legal or not. Uh, NCAA rules wise. Well, once you're once I know you're, I know I can't call in the coach. portal. Once you're in the portal, people can, can talk anything. to you freely. Right. But it's that conversation of encouraging a guy to go into the portal that's not straight up. Or they may use a high school coach, or they may use somebody besides the position coach or a coach of that college. This who was wants a them. teammate. This was a teammate of his in high school that was going to that school. And there they, you go. And oh yeah. He was, yeah, and they talked to him and said, "Well, you know." Let's have a little talk over here. Cause, uh, uh, that is so much more common than you would dream. Yeah, I yeah, would imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's brought an interesting. Uh, it always seems like there's some some rule in the NCAA where it's always being stretched, right? And you know the NCAA is getting ready to come down on it at some point. You know where they're going to really restrict it, and then it's going to hurt kids, right? Because they'll make it so restrictive. Usually. It ends up hurting yeah. the kids. So, uh, so Coach Ed, when you uh, – give me what your thoughts are on these uh, offers to eighth graders, ninth graders, even sophomores. Right. Um, I, tell, right. I tell every parent of the kids I've trained, I, and I got one that's whose parents talk to me a lot uh, right now, and I'm like – Hey, he's only, he's a sophomore. Uh, right. He's got twelve offers, Division One offers, and I tell the parents, "Hey, you know, put a cup of coffee in his left hand and pretend those offers are in his right hand. He still has a cup of coffee, okay? Uh, because the you know he can get cocky, he can get hurt, he can get you know he can get cocky and get fat and not you know not pay attention well, to what also, he's supposed to be doing. All happen. kinds of things, yeah. ego wise, going right. on. Sure. And those coaches are not his friends. <laughs> I hate to and tell you. And they may you not that. even be there next year. I go, they're not the kind of friend I want. I want a friend who says yeah. something to me, they're going to live up to it. But I promise you, you know, over, over my years, I can give you dozens of players that ended up uh, losing literally every offer, some some of which would have 15, 16. Right. You know some of these guys. I do. They played for us. Yeah, yeah they played for and that that lose the offer. So they don't, there's this – that's a kind of a little bit of a scurvy process as well. What do you think of that process? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, as a coach, as a college coach, I have offered guys in the ninth grade. You know, there'll be certain guys, like a kid out of Tallahassee named Ernie Sims who played in the NFL with the Detroit Lions. Yeah. Wow. That dude, he looked like a senior in, in the ninth grade. Uh, he, he had already had the physical attributes that you needed to play the game and with just a little more development, you know, he's going to be more than just good. He's going to be a great player. And he's a great kid, you know. And we offered that kid in the ninth grade, you know. So there have been some guys that I've offered that were very young. You might see. Vitor, let me ask you this. Vitor yeah, sure. is ACL in his senior year, Coach. Would you? Yeah, well, I you obviously have, know coaches that have wouldn't hold. That. Yeah, you yeah, yeah no question. Yeah, and I mean, you I've know a lot of coaches that, that don't, right? Yeah, I've honored, I've honored that more than one occasion. I had a guy who broke his femur, and they had to put a they had to put a uh, uh, whatever you call it plate, um, a plate or whatever in there. He he got he actually got thrown out of a jeep and run over, and I still kept that kid. And um, you know, so you know, I, not I, everybody I, does I, that. You know that? No, right? they don't. They don't. And I, I get it. But the thing that they could do, quite frankly, Coach, you could bring in a kid like that, and he could become a medical DQ. If he can't play again, 
he could become a medical DQ disqualification, still get his full scholarship, and not count against your number, and not count against your 85 number. Oh, okay, I didn't you know anything take, about that. that that's you could, you could take care of those kids. Great. That's I'm awesome. I'm sorry? They call it a waiver. It's not academic. Kind of no, it's, it's, yeah. it's a medical DQ. It's a medical DQ. Yeah, medical, medical waiver. Yeah. Got it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yes. That's so, right. That you happened know, to my uh, brother's son, uh, my brother Mark Mullaney. Yeah, it, it may happen while he's on the campus at college, or it may happen – through the recruiting yes. process, but you, you could bring in a kid that you're like, Hey, if you get healthy enough to play again, you're going to play. But if you can't get healthy enough to play again, we're going to medical disqualify you, which keeps you on scholarship. You get everything that everybody else gets. You just, yep. you just don't count against the number because you, you could never play for this school again. How long has that been going on? Cause remember, I mean, our, one of our roommates, uh, it's been a while. Bob Hayes, remember? He broke right. his back well, in a car yeah. accident. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. He sure did. Broken back well, Bob. You know, yep. Business we messed with him. Businessman Bob. Went to businessman Bob. He, he, he did great. change. Great. Did great. He has done you know, great. I think, but, the, problem with that, I think yeah. the problem with that medical waiver, as I recall, was that you couldn't play. If you took the waiver, you couldn't play football at the Division One level again. Anyway. That's not true. It's You can't play at that school again. Hmm. You can't play at that school again. If you if you get if the doctors at your school medically disqualifies you, you stay on scholarship. You get everything that you need in that regard, but you can never play for Georgia again. But I mean, I had a kid at Georgia that was a Southern Cal got medically disqualified at Southern Cal. Our doctors went and saw him. It was a stenosis thing with his spinal cord. He had gotten hit. He got a bad stinger. They said he can't play for us anymore. Later, a year or so later, he came to our doctors at Georgia. They looked him over. They felt like, you know, he was fine to play, and he was able to play for us. So ended up being a first-round draft pick. But um, So, yeah, you, you could go to another school if their doctors deem you to be healthy enough to go. And most people – I mean, sometimes a coach will want a medical DQ guy to create a number for his team if he thinks the kid's not good enough. But they're not make they're not making up injuries, you know. There is an injury. There's a right. you have to. It's it, there's some bona fide, you know, paper Doc, trail that this yeah, guy's been yeah, hurt. Document. Right. Yeah. So, uh, coach, we're we're a little bit past the hour, and we, I really appreciate you sure. come coming on. Uh, it's very informative. I loved your testimony earlier. Uh, it was uh, Amen. very touching. Touching. Uh, my my uh, personal adventure in that in that area was I I I waited a little longer to fall a little farther, <laughs> so I don't really That's share right. share it publicly. <laughs> but maybe sometime if you ever get to Colorado, we can sit down and talk about it. But uh, uh, I was could, saying God's grace is even greater with you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I I was working at uh, with uh, with a company where Focus on the Family was one of our clients and uh, one of the guys that was VP of the client services there, he uh, really enjoyed my uh, testimony. He says, I want you to, because they have a cathedral where they you, you can go to services at lunchtime or before you come to work inside the main building. And so we'd like, you know, I think you should speak, tell your testimony to, he said, but, but Dr. Dobson has to, has to, right. you know, approve it. And I went in there and he, and Dr. Dobson goes, yeah, we don't really want to tell that story. And <laughs> so that was when he got, that's when he got cut for like the seventh time. <laughs> yeah, I got cut, oh, yeah. I got cut <laughs> from telling my testimony. He says, you know, you want to save that place for the salvation. And, and men, like if you don't mind, I want to put one little plug in. It's not until right. August, but I'm going to have a book coming out. Uh, it's going to nice. be called Make the Call. Yeah, it's going to be called Make the Call, and it's just it's going to be about you know great memories of college and life and and decisions that had to be made throughout, and it'll it'll challenge the reader to make the call in their life too. So uh, that's, that's be fantastic, pretty cool. pretty cool. And we talked about it before we got on the show, but let's uh, the movie, the the movie. Oh yeah, right. facing the giant, facing the giant, facing yeah. the giant. Great, yeah. great movie, folks. If you yeah. haven't seen it. The, uh, the 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 part in that movie the uh, Coach Rick is in it. Let's well, of yeah. course, yeah. Mark's in it, and uh, the Death star, Call stars in it, 
as uh, as a head coach <laughs> and uh, the death crawl. It's it's you, uh, we'll, just, we'll say no more because people. I want people to go yeah. see that movie and I want them to see that death crawl, and I want to see the inspiration yeah. um, and 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 you know and God's gift in it. it so, came of it, yeah. No doubt. It's I appreciate awesome, that. Bro. My, oh, yeah, I mentioned you guys off air that I mentioned off air that 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 movie's been translated into at least twelve different languages and is used as a ministry tool all over the world. So it's fantastic. It's had a, quite a life. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Mark, you know what? We got to have you on again sometime. Mm-hmm. Down. There's so much more to talk about, and and so many right. things you've done um, in your career and are still doing. Um, so we will definitely want to have a repeat of this here. Um, as we get through sure. these episodes and, and have you back on, because uh, I, I, there's we could go another two hours on this on this show and on this topic <laughs> and on, on on the things you've done and the and you know it was interesting. I, I'll say this real quick as we're going to bow out of this, but um, you made a comment and, and it's kind of true. Any all coaches, um, you know, that have an impact on kids' lives and uh, young men, um, it's interesting how their ki- those kids still follow you. And when you move from you know when you left. Uh, uh, Georgia and you went to Miami and then when you left Miami um you know all the tweets and and uh and emails and all the th- calls and right. everything you're getting from all the guys you coached and uh and and yeah. and changed lives well, Howard Howard did the same I mean Howard co- what, yeah. what thing had good head coaches like you do is you t- turn uh, young young boys into men right and and they don't know it at the time sometimes and they come back later and and that's when you know you got them right you Michael me. Irvin, y'all know Michael Irvin. His son yeah. played for me in Miami, and you know he's going through he's like everybody going through, just going through it. Michael said, "Hey, coach, squeeze the boy until the man comes out," and I love I love that. <laughs> he said, "Squeeze the boy until the man comes out." That's so, perfect. That's awesome. Isn't that, isn't that exactly what happens? That's exactly what happens. Well, Coach, we appreciate you coming on. And uh, yeah. give us a call if you come out to Colorado. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want, I want to catch up with you, Bale or Beaver Creek or wherever. I love you, man. Well, it took, you know, right. I mean, love I, you too, I've met, I think I've met Urban like 12 times, no, 12 or 13 times. Is that still, what still calls him buddy. Still, does, still doesn't know me. <laughs> so if you come out here, maybe I can make an impression. I'll never forget that I face, Coach Moles. I'll never forget. <laughs> All right, man. Well, All right, guys. thanks a lot. See you later. Great day. Take thanks, care. Buddy. All right. Bye. All right. God bless. All right, guys. We're uh, going to wrap this thing up and talk about Cobble Bank for a minute and, and any of your real estate needs. So, uh, as you know, uh, Moles is brand new to the real estate business, but uh, has been in business in general for his entire life uh, for the kids in college, um, in the corporate world, you name it. So sales is nothing new to him. And uh, the market's been vibrant. Uh, things are going on and off the market. We're as low in inventory as we've ever been in 20 years. Uh, financing is a little tough for jumbo financing. So keep that in mind. And always, uh, if you're talking to a lender, talk to us. And we'll tell you who to talk to because I can't tell you how many deals are falling because some of the lenders are out of that jumbo business. So uh, outside of that, um, you give me a call at 303-843-1545 and give Moles a call at uh, 720-722-1559. Uh, it was up in Evergreen. I'm down here in the metro. Uh, we both handle, you know, from A to Z, uh, all across the front range in the five county region. I think I've done stuff out in Kiowa and Breckenridge and you name it over the years. Good to get a real estate license in Colorado is a state license. We don't operate out of your company. So, so uh, feel free to use the bus. Stay out of the mountain. Flatliner. Yeah. They call us Flatlanders up there, right? But, uh, we live inside of your world. So I sold, uh, recently sold a house in the 